Good morning, everyone. Um, I do have an announcement. It's an unhappy one. It may put all of you in trouble. I've learned that nobody, nobody is allowed to be in the garage for luncheon meetings, uh, only, only evening events. So any of you who are there, uh, we'll talk as fast as we can. You can get out, really. It, in, in any case, it's a great pleasure to welcome Trudy Rubin back to the Shamel Forum World Affairs Luncheon Series. We need her. Trudy has as wide a range of expertise on world affairs as anyone I know, but her topic today is one that at this very moment dominates our thoughts and boggles our minds. It is on the one hand a new day in the Middle East, and on the other, a century-old history inevitably insinuates itself into the present. Coupled with the complexities of the region, there is also the perplexing question of our changing status there, particularly in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, but in, in the entire region. Trudy will examine the evolution of our military and humanitarian involvements there and consider prospects for the future. That's a big order. And so I'm especially grateful that she was able to tear herself away from the demands of her job at the Philadelphia Inquirer, and also that she was not torn away to the Middle East by the demands of that job. Uh, she will be going there soon. And speaking of the Philadelphia Inquirer, I would be remiss if I did not call to your attention Trudy's article in Sunday's paper on the Palestinian state issue in the United Nations. I've put copies of it at each table. How fortunate we are to have one of the most highly regarded experts in the Middle East with us at this crucial time in its history. Please join me in welcoming back Trudy Rubin, foreign affairs columnist for the Philadelphia Inquirer, and someone I consider to be a pundit's pundit, Trudy. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be back here. Um, the only sad part is that uh, things are so much more gloomier even than they seemed two years ago. Uh, when I contemplate talking about the future of US policy in the Middle East, what I have to start by saying, and it won't be a surprise to any of you, I think, is that in all my decades of covering the region, I don't think that I have ever seen U.S. influence and U.S. leverage at such a low ebb. I'm going to start just by listing reasons why I think our influence has shrunk so dramatically, and then I'll talk a little bit about the situation in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and where that's headed, and um, how that impacts on our future influence and what the outcomes there potentially look like. Um, and as for Israel-Palestine, it will come up uh, during my remarks, but I'm happy to talk about it more in questions. It, when I started listing the reasons that I thought U.S. influence had diminished, you know, the list kept growing longer and longer, which is quite depressing. Well, you can start out with the obvious, that just as we in the United States know that um, our country is financially stressed and exhausted by two wars, so does the rest of the world. Um, you know, our budget debates are no secret. And in fact, <clears throat> the last debate over the debt limit contributed, oh, excuse me, I have to get some water. The last debate over the debt limit had an international aspect that I think a lot of people weren't aware of, which is that it contributed to the image of incompetence and government breakdown that has been spreading around the world given the financial crash in 2008, which much of the world rightly blames on the mess we made um, uh, with our banking system and not understanding the very products that we were selling. Um, it contributes to the uh, image of incompetence that was fostered by the Iraq War. 
and also by the war in Afghanistan. So you start with this enormous image problem and the fact that it's based on real weaknesses of the United States, growing weaknesses. Then, of course, you have the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring is a phenomenon that is bottom up, and it is not something that we can control. Uh, at, at many people have criticized President Obama for not having a consistent policy from country to country. But let me tell you, first of all, they are all different. And secondly, there are so many factors involved that we couldn't manage any of those countries' developments if we tried. We might be able to ameliorate in some cases, but not clear. And it's been proven in Iraq and Afghanistan that we have not figured out how to help new democracies in Muslim areas develop institutions. And I'll get back to that. Um, so uh, the Arab Spring out of control. The failures in Iraq, moreover, have contributed to an image of the United States as um, in not only incompetent in trying to impose democracy, but hypocritical. Um, we tried to bring in democracy from the top, and the mess that we made in Iraq, I think, is a tragedy that will haunt us for years. So nobody in the Middle East believes anymore in the idea that the United States can help build democracy. Uh, in fact, Iraq has, is seen as the anti-democracy, and I'll get back to that in a minute too, but anyone who tells you that the Arab Spring is a result, actually, of what President Bush did in Iraq has it exactly backwards. What people in countries now that are having these rebellions say is we don't want to be like Iraq. So you have this combination of U.S. weakness, of which the world is very aware, of um, Arab revolts whose outcome is unclear and which we have limited ability to manage, uh, failure in Iraq and Afghanistan, rise of other powers in the region like Turkey, and, and here's where Israel-Palestine comes in, one of the major reasons that Arab countries looked to us in the region was that we were the mediator on the Israel-Palestinians issue. And now, effectively, we are no longer. Um, one reason is that President Bush made a determined decision to pull back from that mediation role. He talked about two states. but there was a determined policy at the highest levels in the administration that it had to be done by the, policy, by the parties themselves and we should pretty much stay out. Uh, and even though at the end of the Bush administration that changed a little bit, not enough. So there was no pressure on that issue from the Bush administration, long years of letting the peace process atrophy, and the Obama administration has just made a mess of it. Uh, not to say that it's easy, uh, they were dealing with an Israeli government where Prime Minister Netanyahu truly does not believe in the two-state solution. Um, in the past, I've discussed this, had a chance to interview him on this, and I don't think anything has changed since the first time I spoke with him in 1996. He truly believes two states are a danger to Israel, although he may speak otherwise. And so, uh, apart from the flaws of the Palestinians, this is an Israeli government that wants to delay the process, not to advance it. And so uh, the U.S. basically flubbed it. Um, the process is virtually dead. President Obama has now spent the past few months running around trying to prevent a U.N. resolution, which was not preventable because there was nothing to offer the Palestinians as an alternative. And our influence on that issue has shrunk to nearly zero, and that puts us at a disadvantage in the region as a whole, because if we are not this major player who is looked at as the only country that can bring the two sides together, our influence in the region diminishes even more. Let me get to some specifics about the countries that I was asked to discuss, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Uh, where are we now? Where are we going, given the diminished influence that I have just been talking about? I've been focused on the Middle East, 
but it also extends to Afghanistan and Pakistan. In Iraq, I'll just mention to start something that I've written three columns on and hurts me deeply, and to me it's symptomatic of where we are in the region. Uh, these columns I've written have been on the subject of the Iraqis who worked for us, uh, translators who worked for our military, who worked for State Department officials, uh, who worked for contractors. These people are in mortal danger because they worked for us. This gives you a sense, even before I start to talk, of what the level is of our influence in Iraq, even though we spent 10 years, expended 5,000 American lives, uh, our errors were instrumental in causing tens of thousands of Iraqi lives. I mean, Iraqis also bear blame, but we precipitated, despite all the blood and treasure we have uh, expended there, these people are in mortal danger, their lives are being threatened, their families are being threatened, and in 2008, Congress passed a bill authorizing 25,000 special primary visas to be issued to people who worked for us, who could show they had, and um, they were supposed to be able to leave with immediate family members. Until the present date, 3,500 only of those visas have been issued, and uh, 1,500 are pending, but the whole program is frozen. Only 10 of the visas were issued in August. It is frozen because of new security checks that these Iraqis are being told will take up to eight months. By this, that time, we will be pulled out of Iraq. And these people, I, I, I am getting deluged with emails from desperate Iraqis who have worked with our troops, who have gone out on dangerous missions, who have letters of recommendation from their officers, people who work for the State Department in Baghdad, it, they, uh, people who have had relatives killed because they worked for the Americans, daughter kidnapped. I, I, every day I look at my email and I'm afraid to open it because these letters are so horrifying. And yet, and yet, I have spoken to the highest U.S. officials. They tell me, oh, we are making plans to deal with it, and nothing is happening. Uh, this, to me, is symptomatic. I have asked them, why don't you have an airlift? But the administration doesn't want an airlift because it looks like Vietnam. If you airlift out these people who helped us, that's a sign of failure. That's not what they say, but I think that's what they mean. I raise this issue for two reasons. One, um, if you have any interest in it, I think it's something that church groups, uh, women's groups, and so forth should belabor their senators and congressmen about because only if there is a constant stream of emails will any interest be shown in this. But secondly, I, and, and if you want more information or to see my columns, you can email me. I'll give you my email at the end or tell you how to find the columns. But I raise it secondly because I think it shows to what a sorry pass things have um, traveled in, in Iraq. Iraq basically is a satellite of Iran these days. Um, we are scheduled to pull out all our troops by the end of this year. The Defense Department uh, has been talking with Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki about keeping a small follow-on presence of troops. Uh, however, Maliki is dependent for his political survival on the Sadrist movement and the seats that they have in Parliament. The Sadrists are a radical Shiite group uh, whose leader, Muqtada al-Sadr is based in Gum, Iran, training to be an Ayatollah. The Iranians, because they have a long border, because they are a neighbor, because they share a Shiite faith with the majority of Iraqis, were always going to be influential in, in Iraq after Saddam, especially in a situation which was a so-called democracy, which meant Shiites were in the majority, and Shiite parties would probably uh, be in power. However, the constitutional system that we helped the Iraqis set up um, really emphasized sectarian parties. I don't think it's 
what we intended, but it's the way the Constitution that we helped structure pushed the system. And in a sectarian party situation with Shiite parties in charge, it was inevitable that Iran was going to have more and more influence, especially after we left. Secular Shiites have basically been pushed to the margins, and the current leader, as I said, Prime Minister Maliki, even though he is nominally secular, he's not a cleric, he doesn't, uh, 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 he's not an Islamist who wants an Islamic state, but he is increasingly unpopular, unpopular because he does, hasn't delivered services or goods. He hasn't really welcomed Sunni parties into the process as he promised the Americans he would do. Sunni parties were promised the defense ministry and the interior ministry, very important posts. And now, uh, more than a year and a half, I think it is, since Iraqi elections or more, those posts still have not been filled because Maliki won't give them to the Sunni political parties. So he is increasingly unpopular and has to lean on an allied party of Muqtada al-Sadr, which is totally beholden to the Iranians. The Iranians have invested all kinds of money in, in Iraq. They have an enormous intelligence presence there, and the more that Maliki depends on them, uh, the more influence Iran has and the more threat to any follow-on presence that we leave. Military commanders in Iraq have asked to have a larger presence if we're going to leave troops just to indicate that it is a substantial interest of the United States to ensure that Iraq remains independent and not totally under the Iranian thumb. But in today's climate of budget cutting and uh, at a time when uh, Obama has promised his base that we will pull out from Iraq, and if 10 or 15,000 troops remained, which is what our commander there wishes, uh, General Austin, it would be hard, I think, for Obama to sell this domestically. And so what's being talked about now is to leave 3,000 trainers to train the Iraqi troops. 3,000 is a number that's so small that I fear these Americans will be endangered if one leaves such a small number. Beyond that, what the Bush administration had hoped in Iraq was that after the Civil War ended, and it did end under General Petraeus and the surge, I mean, that did save Iraq from something even more horrific, um, the Bush administration had hoped that a strategic framework accord, which we signed with them, calling for all kinds of joint programs in culture, in economy, in exchange of students, would keep Iraq uh, close in relationship to the United States. I've just recently, I was called uh, from Wintertour, um, a, a group of uh, Iraqi museum curators had come over on this program, and they were then going to UPenn Archaeology Museum. The hope was that programs like this, and there's quite a bit of money devoted to them, uh, would develop and prolong the relationship between us and Iraq. Towards that end, we have a humongous embassy in Iraq. There are 17,000 civilians staying on after our troops leave. But of these 17,000, 5,000 are security contractors because we have no troops left to protect all these civilians who supposedly would be going out on agriculture projects, would be going out on cultural projects. What I fear is that in a situation where Iraq is more and more beholden to Iran and where our influence has diminished sharply, where we have no military presence anymore and the 3,000 trainers won't cut it, and where we have all these civilians protected only by civilian contractors who have a bad odor in Iraq for deserved reasons since in the heyday of the occupation, civilian contractors, notably Blackwater, but others too, 
ran roughshod over Iraqi civilians because there was no oversight over them, and they could do as they pleased, and they did, killing civilians, wounding them, etc. I don't know which companies are going to be making up these 5,000, but my guess is that Iranian-influenced press will uh, vilify them in Iraqi media. My guess is that they will become targets. My guess is that all of these civilians from different departments here, education, health and welfare, so, that are trying to you know, do good, or American NGOs, non-governmental organizations, trying to do good, will not be able to get out of the embassy or will not be able to get out of armored convoys and escorted by uh, um, civilian security contractors. This is not a pretty situation, and it is not one in which I think that the U.S. influence, as hoped for under this strategic framework accord, can be extended in a healthy way. So I fear that Iraq will become symptomatic of our shrinking influence in the region rather than our um, uh, continuing relationship with a new democracy. Uh, I think, uh, um, how late does this go? I should have found this out before, until? 1.30. Okay, I'm fine. Uh, on to Afghanistan, huh? Um, uh, you know, I was in Afghanistan in May last, and I went to Kandahar. Uh, Kandahar, as you may know, is in the south of Afghanistan. It is the, the it was the, the Taliban's heartland capital. It's where Mullah Omar had his home. I was actually inside th those buildings, which are now, um, uh, headquarters for CIA and Special Forces. Um, it is the area to which we sent the surge troops. Uh, that province and neighboring Helmand province were where the surge was focused, the aim being to try to stabilize those two provinces that uh, were where the Taliban was very extremely strong and considered their heartland. When I was in Kandahar, I didn't want to stay with the military because I wanted to get out and see the city. So I stayed with civilian Afghans, a, a woman, a young woman uh, who was the daughter of the mayor and was running a, a non-governmental organization to help Afghan women uh, learn weaving, and they did products that are sold here. A very courageous young woman who uh, w came to the U.S. as a refugee with her family and her father, who was an accountant in Virginia, and for 20 years, she went back first after finishing university in Virginia. She wanted to go back to her homeland, and she went back right after uh, we kicked the Taliban out of um, or we and the Afghan ground forces kicked the Taliban out of Afghanistan and started this NGO. Her, she married her husband there. Um, and she convinced her father to come back and work as mayor of Kandahar, a job that he got because the fam he had been a childhood friend of the Karzai brothers who came from that same area. Um, so you had this accountant from Virginia who was the mayor of, of um, Kandahar, a rather tragic story because he really was dedicated, but he thought, I think, that he was back in Virginia and didn't understand exactly what his country had become. So I spent a couple of hours with him and I interviewed also Ahmed Wali Karzai, uh, the famous half-brother of Karzai, who was the dawn uh, of Kandahar, uh, the head of the provincial council and the powerhouse. Uh, many people felt he profited from the drug trade, but the Americans needed him and the CIA paid him. A um, couple of months after I came back from my trip, uh, Ahmed Wali was assassinated. A couple of weeks later, Mayor Hamidi was assassinated. Um, and this, in essence, <laughs> is what you need to know about Afghanistan. Um, there is no question that the surge troops in Kandahar stabilized that area, that province, but I traveled around the province, that, that part I did with the military, no other way, and talked to district governors, district police chiefs, and the first thing that struck me is each one that I met would show me a photograph of his predecessor who had been assassinated. Um, so, 
And then we had the mayor, and, and, and just uh, today, um, and, uh, Tony kindly showed me uh, on her BlackBerry something that just happened that I hadn't seen yet. Uh, the head of the Afghan Higher Peace Council, Mr. Rabani, was assassinated today. The Higher Peace Council is charged with trying to get talks going between Afghan for Afghan diplomats and, and officials and the Taliban. So that's the Taliban message, death to you. Um, so uh, <laughs> where do we stand in Afghanistan? Again, I think it is a question of diminishing influence. Uh, everyone knows that we are supposed to be out by the end of 2014, although I will tell you the administration does want to keep troops on afterwards for stability purposes. Uh, the number undetermined. Karzai also wants that, and talks are going on. But the problem is that our whole policy of withdrawal is based on certain premises. <clears throat> um, one premise is that we have stabilized, and it is true, these southern provinces. The Taliban has been hurt badly. Uh, their infrastructure, their leadership structure have been hurt badly. Uh, and the thinking is that they could be diminished to a point where the Afghan forces that we are training could take over. This is dubious. The problem is if you still have major instability when we leave, and if the psychology of the population is that the Americans are leaving and therefore nothing is certain with an incompetent government in Kabul, it is very, very hard to hold on to those gains, especially since what the Taliban have turned to, since they can't win on the field, what they've turned to is assassination. And as we see, they are very, very successful at it. Now Karzai's hope and a hope of the Obama administration a year ago, even six months ago, was that one way to facilitate the exit was talks with the Taliban. Uh, nobody imagined that this would be easy, but the thinking was that the Taliban, having been hurt so badly, at least portions of their leadership might be willing to settle for a deal where they would get cabinet ministries or governorships and come in from the cold. There are three major groups of Taliban. Uh, I don't know if, if you, uh, you may already know. I mean, there's the Quetta Shura that's run by Mullah Omar. There's the Haqqani Network, a specially vicious bunch based in Pakistan, and another bunch based in Pakistan led by a monster named Gulbadin Hikmatiar, um, who people think can be bought. Um, uh, he wants power and money, as do many of the figures in this tragedy, and so people think, okay, he could be bought, Mullah Omar could be wooed, and the Haqqani brothers can be killed. That's basically the way the thinking had gone until now. The problem is, it is not working. Um, the Pakistanis, uh, have decided the Pakistanis hold the trump cards in any talks with the Taliban because all of the Taliban leadership have safe havens in Pakistan and uh, their troops come back there to refresh and rearm and then go forward again into Afghanistan. And Pakistan, as you know, is the most complex of allies and I think Pakistan has decided that they w do not trust us, they will not trust us, they know we do not trust them, especially after finding Osama bin Laden in one of their military base cities. And they've just decided to play their own game on this. And they want to control the Taliban, and they want their people in power in Kabul because they see Afghanistan as a hedge against India. They do not want Indian influence in Kabul. Karzai is friendly to the Indians. And so the Pakistanis basically are going to screw us. And they will not shut down the safe havens. They will not cooperate in pushing the Taliban leadership to the bargaining table. They will not do any of this 
unless they are in the driver's seat and they get to shape the government that takes over. Uh, so again, it comes back to this question of influence. Uh, in Afghanistan, um, you know, there are so many things you could have said, but ba not to revisit the past, all the mistakes that were made, the diversion to Iraq, uh, could we have stabilized things if we didn't move all our intelligence assets to Iraq, all our focus to Iraq. But it's too late now, and the fact is that domestic forces are pressing Obama to pull out. Even many Republicans are now talking suddenly as if they were Democratic doves. Many of the Tea Party are saying things that if Obama had said them when he was running, he would have been denounced as a wimp. And so you have a convergence of pressures that will keep this drawdown moving. You have an unlikelihood of talks with the Taliban. You have a question mark over whether Afghan forces can really be trained to take over when we leave. And you have you know, an absence of peace negotiations. What it all leads up to is a huge question mark over the future of Afghanistan when we leave and another denouement that undercuts America's ability to influence the Middle East and the Muslim world in the next decade. You know, I have mentioned Pakistan. The Obama team has come to the point now where they are so frustrated with Pakistan that they now practically curse them out loud. That is only in the months since the death of Osama bin Laden. Um, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mullen, who will soon be stepping down, actually, at the end of this month, a very personable, nice, gentlemanly man, invested the last two years in trying to build a relationship of trust with the head of the Pakistani military, who's the real power in that country. General Kayani. The idea is that if we could overcome past tensions, we could get them to understand that their interests and our interests converge when it came to fighting terrorists and Taliban, because the Taliban now threaten Pakistan itself. That assumes we live in an age of reason. We don't. Uh, Pakistan trains some terrorists to fight India in Kashmir. And even though those same terrorists have turned around and are threatening Pakistan, Pakistan will not curb them, will not wipe them out. Pakistan originally trained the Taliban and helped them take over in 96. Um, it will not recognize that those Taliban that were its children are now linked up with much worse jihadis, including al-Qaeda elements, and will ultimately threaten them. If they put them in power in Kabul, it will be a Frankenstein that they cannot control. But they don't face up to that, because they think they want to use their baby Taliban to put in power in, in Kabul, and then Afghanistan will be safe backyard for them. And nothing that Chairman Mullen said to them uh, nothing that General McChrystal said to them, because he tried the same honey approach. General Petraeus came in, and he was nastier. They don't like General Petraeus because he was tougher with them in private. Didn't work either. They are sticking to this suicidal policy. And we are stuck with them. I have talked to senior Obama officials, and I've said, well, this is really interesting. Until the Obama, uh, Osama bin Laden killing, you never criticize them in public. Well, the fact is, US officials are fed up, but they don't know what to do. So, for example, just this week, uh, um, Defense Secretary Panetta came out publicly and accused the Pakistani intelligence of having had knowledge of attacks on our embassy and on NATO headquarters, which took place last week, um, of, or, and of being uh, 
uh, in cahoots with the terrorist group that is believed to have plotted those attacks, which is the Haqqani Network. And there's no question that the ISI is in bed with the Haqqani Network. So now we criticize them publicly. Even Admiral Mullen has, Chairman Mullen has criticized Pakistan publicly, has accused them of murdering journalists, which is true, has accused, um, nobody says publicly that we think they knew Osama bin Laden was in Abbottabad. And I've, t I've spoken to very high US officials, very senior, who say they think somebody knew but they don't think the head of Pakistani intelligence knew. You know, my attitude is, if he didn't know, it was deliberate deniability, because um, you have to know something like that. You cannot run as pervasive an intelligence agency as the Pakistanis run and not know it, unless you deliberately ensured that you didn't know it. You said, don't tell me. You said, I don't want to know. And middle and upper middle levels took care of the job of protecting Osama bin Laden. One interesting little factoid, there were no tunnels, escape routes, under that house in which he lived, which leads US intelligence to believe that it was assumed the Pakistanis would tip him off if the Americans ever got close and that he would be whisked away by Pakistani intelligence officials. So we are dealing with this <laughs> ally and that, as I am told by US officials, we have to keep dealing with because they have nuclear weapons. And indeed, uh, one big fear of the administration is that Islamists in Pakistan will penetrate the military, which they've already done on a couple of occasions, uh, and will perhaps even whether uh, get their hands on nuclear materials or even worse, take over the military and at some point carry out a coup. This is the biggest nightmare. So again, influence diminishing uh, with an ally that is critical, but despite the money we give them, uh, will not play ball with us, will not uh, uh, admit that its influence converges. Now, some people say, oh, well, the US could in increase that influence by helping negotiate a settlement over Kashmir uh, uh, between India and Pakistan. The Pakistanis would like us to try. The Indians aren't interested. Um, the Indians now are full of themselves. They are a rising power. They don't need the United States to tell them what to do over Kashmir. Again, a symptom of a changing world in which our influence is either diminishing or is not desired. And so, you know, when I look at this region, and especially watching what's going on at the UN, when you see the Palestinians have given up on the US, the US is about to veto this two-state solution in the United Nations, which will further decrease our influence in the Arab world. We have no leverage as a negotiator. Um, the Arab Spring will do its thing no matter what we do and will probably result in Islamists becoming a major force in the region. Um, I, I look at this and I say, I really am not sure how the United States reasserts itself where it counts. I will say that we are still in the game when it comes to China although China thinks that our influence is diminishing rapidly. And, sorry, I do it all the time. Um, you know, China, you see officials, military and civilian, all the time um, talking about how they think the US is a spent force. And I do think it's important to pay more attention to how to counter that uh, in Asia where we have a lot of interests and which cannot simply be left to China as their hegemonic region. Um, but on the other hand, the Chinese look at the debt that we have to them. They look at how European banks are contemplating, you know, could we ask for a Chinese bailout because they're the ones that have the cash 
And the Chinese do realize <laughs> that they are much more in the driver's seat in a lot of ways than we are uh, when it comes to the global economy and when it comes to expanding defense spending. Um, so, <laughs> you know, where does this leave us, she asks. I will tell you that I go round and round in writing my column trying to look for the bright side. You know, in times past, one felt, and I always felt, being the grandchild of immigrants, um, you know, that this was a country that could and would renew itself, that this was a country where, uh, when push came to shove, common sense prevailed, where the center would hold, and uh, where uh, radicalism would not flourish. I find myself grasping. You know, I was at an event last night with the columnist David Brooks, and I was asking him, I said, you're the guru on centrism. You know, you're always calling for centrists. Do you think uh, Governor Perry will get the nomination? And he said to me, oh, no, no, you know, people will realize. You know, I think he's like me, you know, where, you know, sort of hoping that that good American common sense reasserts itself. But even if it does, we are in an economic hole. And I think that we are also sort of in a, in a deep um, strategic hole overseas, born of the fact that the Iraq war um, did tremendous damage to our credibility, to our image of competence, to the belief that America's military power necessarily meant that America would prevail. Um, Afghanistan might wind up doing likewise, and I am very afraid of the future of Pakistan. And in the Middle East, I am tremendously saddened by the fact that Obama is not in a position, even should he have the guts to, to come out with his own peace plan and to have the strength to rally Europeans, um, Russia, China, um, and put it to Prime Minister Netanyahu, give us your realistic plan. What do you need for security? But do not come back and tell me that there cannot be two states on a reasonable basis. I don't think Obama can do that for many reasons, not the least of which, and perhaps the most important of which, is that I think there's a misunderstanding on both sides of the aisle in Congress that the status quo can simply continue with Israel and the Palestinians, and that that is the best route for Israel to follow. Um, there is no good route. I will say that up front, in the past, I have been very, very critical of the Palestinians for missed opportunities. But at this point, I think there's a misunderstanding that the status quo can last. And frankly, the status quo is under threat everywhere, which is one reason why our influence is waning, because the status quo here <laughs> cannot stand. And so, uh, you know, I, I look around and I say, what is the best hope um, for a breathing period so that in the best of circumstances, America could regenerate? And I, I say, well, maybe our enemies will self-destruct. Al-Qaeda has sort of self-destructed, even though other terrorist groups are coming up the pike. But really, Al-Qaeda has harmed itself by bombing Arab civilians. I mean, this is really true. Um, it is possible that Iran will self-destruct. I cannot believe that that regime will last forever when such a large percentage of the population detests it. But we can't know how long that shift will take. <laughs> but what I worry about more is that our friends will self-destruct before our enemies self-destruct and before we regenerate ourselves. I worry that Pakistan will commit suicide uh, by not facing up to the enemy within and letting that enemy devour it, uh, a country with nukes. And I worry that Israel will self-destruct. I do not think that the Israeli state will ever go under. But I do believe that if it follows its current policies, it will become an isolated and sad place um, with the world looking at it akin to South Africa because it will be permanently ruling over a large, un 
willing Arab population that will eventually be a majority and that will not have civil rights because if it is given civil rights, Arabs will outnumber Jews. And don't let anyone tell you that you could have one Israeli-Palestinian state with one man, one vote because that neighborhood is not the United States and it's a communal neighborhood and each community wants to be on top as we've seen in Lebanon and Iraq. So there have to be two states. There cannot be one state for both peoples. So um, all I can say is let us hope that our enemies self-destruct before our friends do, and that we regenerate before our influence has totally wasted away. I wish I could be more positive, but that's all I've got to say. <laughs> Thank you. So we have time for questions, so lots. Yes. Oh, oh, you want to? Um, in Afghanistan, I hear news reports that the people, men on the street, women on the street, are terrified of our pullout um, because they just believe the Taliban is just going to come right back in and do all the repressions and do with women and kill everyone, as you said, anyone that was working with us. Is that pretty much what's going to happen? Is it going to be a bloodbath? Um, I think that I think certainly educated people are terrified that the Taliban is going to come back. Certainly, Afghan women uh, who have become more active are terrified. Uh, you know, I have a friend who runs shelters for women in Herat in the West, which is far from the worst area, and uh, you know, she's already trying to figure out how to get her six kids you know, in school, uh, in other countries, so that if the moment comes, you know, they won't go down with her. Um, and, you know, inevitably, we return to this issue of betrayal, because Afghans are in, also, there's an allotment for them of these SIV visas to get them out, but nobody even wants to talk about that in Afghanistan, because in Iraq, uh, you know, we're almost out, and still we won't consider an airlift. In Afghanistan, supposedly, you know, the surge is working. So no visas. They're getting no visas. I think there were two SIV visas given so far this year. Um, but it's a horrible thing to think that the only answer is, you know, to take out everyone, you know, who who uh, might be endangered. That, But, yes, th I mean, there is a lot of ambivalence. Even even amongst villagers or in more rural areas. It's the same ambivalence I heard in Iraq. You know, people used to say the Iraqis want the Americans out. Here, in the anti-war movement, people said that. But when you would go to Iraq, the same people that would tell you the Americans should leave, and then you would say, well, should they leave tomorrow? Would, would you like to see them just start going, no, 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 no. They should leave, but not until they stabilize this country. I mean, they brought chaos here, and they have to make it safe before they go. There is a terrible fear. Um, and Afghans, first of all, there's no trust in the police. The police is corrupt. The army, we have done a lot with training, but the problem with the army is that the areas where the Taliban is strong uh, in, in the south and the east, where um, it's a heavily Pashtun population, we can't recruit for the army. Um, the army is heavily made up of either uh, um, Tajiks, Hazaras, which are large minorities. I mean, the, the Pashtuns are a plurality, they're not a majority. And there is a large number of Pashtuns in the army, but they are from um, provinces that have Pashtun minorities, not from the belt that's along Pakistan, where all the trouble is, or most of the trouble. So the question is whether you can send those troops in, whether they will hold. If we pull out and we are not behind them, whether they will crumble. Uh, you know, General Petraeus always used to say in Iraq, and it was true that it was only when the tide turned that the Afghan army, you know, sort of found its cojones. Um, I mean, there was a turning point uh, and, and in, in Basra where uh, Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki at that time was more independent than he is now. There were more U.S. troops there. Now he's more a prisoner of Iran. 
back then, uh, Basra, the second largest city down near the oil fields, was captive to all these radical Shiite militias fueled by Iranian intelligence, which is just across the border there in the south. And Malki sent troops down before they were ready. I mean, he and Petraeus had been planning an operation, but he just sped it up, sent them down there. They would have been defeated if Petraeus hadn't very quickly sent in backup air support. However, they won with our air support, and they got much more uh, courageous after that. But that was after the Civil War was basically over. Now, in Afghanistan, if you're still in the middle of fighting, if there's still attacks on military bases, if the East still has a lot of bloodshed going on, and the South a lot of assassinations, then these troops may not have the courage um, to go into situations where they're going to get slaughtered. Um, and I mean, in massed battles, they might prevail, but that's not what you fight in Afghanistan. And they might just fall apart. So um, that's why people are afraid. Yes, they are afraid. And even Karzai wants US troops to stay. And people were very upset when Obama said we were leaving at the end of 2011, which I think was a mistake, um, you know, because they sort of wrote the U.S. presence off very early. Now, with all the talk of 2014, there's a little bit more of a breather, but people still know we're going. Yes? Do you believe that in Pakistan there is a real threat of their nuclear weapons being getting into bad hands? <clears throat> You know, it's on the one hand and the other hand, they do have a good security system for the actual weapons. Uh, you know, it is a multi-layered system and so forth. I think there's two fears. Uh, you know, one or maybe three fears. Um, recently, militants from uh, with links to Al Qaeda took over a major Pakistani naval base in Karachi. And it is widely believed and written about in the Pakistani press that they had contacts inside the Navy. And uh, it is also widely believed, and if those of you who read The New Yorker, there was a very good piece last week by Dexter Filkins about this particular episode. There was a Pakistani journalist murdered recently. And the U.S. has said publicly, Admiral Mullen said publicly, that we believe from our intelligence, which means intercepts, that the Pakistani ISI intelligence killed him. And the reason they killed him was because he was writing about links between the Navy and Al Qaeda, certain people. So there's several threats. Could they take over a nuclear facility? Could there be an operation? Well, then you know, they, they might not be able to hold it forever. It isn't taking over the country. It doesn't mean that they could get stuff out, but it would be a disaster, or could be. That's one threat. Threat number two, um, nuclear materials for a dirty bomb. Could somebody smuggle them out if they penetrated the military? What I worry about the most, I don't think, I mean, it's not like you can take an actual weapon out in a suitcase. I just worry about the Islamicization of the military itself, where you have somebody who becomes commander in chief and then appoints a head of the intelligence, and then you realize that the, the institution has been penetrated. You know, the military claims this can't happen, but I don't see why not. Um, uh, because there is just so much interconnection and so much penetration 10 years down the line. Why shouldn't that happen? And that's what worries me the most. The thoughts of the Civil War in Iraq, I can't see that it's not going to come back. What are your I think the Civil War as it was won't come back basically because the Shiites won and the Sunnis lost, and the Sunnis don't have the stomach to fight it again. Now, it's, it's clear, I mean, when it, when it started, Al-Qaeda very cleverly set the sides against each other, and the Sunnis felt they had to fight. Um, but there's whole areas of Baghdad that have been ethnically cleansed so that the neighborhood's homogeneous. 
The Sunnis now have more power in the areas where they're stronger. They have political power, and I think that even with Iran calling a lot of the shots, the Iranians aren't interested in a civil war, so I think there'll be an effort to buy those areas off, you know, with oil money, I mean, more development money and so forth. I mean, that doesn't mean there won't be fighting on the fault lines, and it's clear that there's some renewed effort um, to, to get this kind of fighting going again because there's been bombs in Shiite mosques, which you can only <clears throat> define as an effort to start the Shiite militias killing Sunnis again. I actually think that on this, Iran will be a useful influence because I don't think the Iranians want it to start again. It's too dangerous because it has repercussions in Bahrain and, 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 uh, um, and there's all, already those Sunni-Shiite tensions are growing in Bahrain, in Lebanon, and of course in Syria where there's a real danger that if Assad goes, the 10% minority, which he belongs to, the Alawites, which is a Shiite off, offshoot, will be slaughtered by the 90% Sunni majority. Um, and so I think there will be an effort to restrain radical Shiite militias from taking big time revenge against uh, you know, bombs put in their midst by terrorists that everybody knows are provocateurs. Um, you know, that doesn't mean there won't be assassinations. It doesn't mean there might not be some fighting on the seam line between Kurds and Sunnis, which is another issue. It will not be pretty. It doesn't mean bombs won't go off. But the kind of massive bloodshed with thousands of bodies turning up every month in the morgue, I, I think, is past. Yes? Uh, switching geographic years just a little bit to Arab Spring, summer, and fall. Uh, I know you're going to Tunisia next month for the elections. Um, what's your analysis of that historic event? And also, it's neighboring countries. Well, the headline is probably something that you've already seen in the newspapers, which is that the, the non-Islamist parties do not seem uh, capable of learning the mechanics of the game fast enough, and the Islamists seem to have that natural knack for organization that comes from having social networks through the mosque. And so um, it's the same in Tunisia. Uh, you know, in, in Tunisia, where, I mean, Supposedly, the Islamists are more moderate. They were banned for many years. Um, the head of uh, the Nahda party, which is their Islamist party, now it's, the party has been re-legalized. He has come back from exile, Mr. Ganucci. He is elderly and quite inflammatory in his remarks. So other people from the Nahda leadership are trying to keep him under wraps and uh, give out a more moderate line. I mean, clearly the country is more moderate, more educated, more middle class, there's very active women's movement, there's active trade union. However, what the Islamists have been able to do is penetrate those movements. Um, uh, you know, cadres within the labor movement who are religious. And I mean, the other thing that's very interesting, uh, which I experienced in Egypt, I was in Egypt in February, I'm going back next month. Um, you go into the popular neighborhoods, working class neighborhoods. People don't want a religious government, say of the kind that, that uh, Iran has with clerics in charge, but they're not afraid of the Muslim Brotherhood because what they have seen is basically social work. And so if you say, well, but the Muslim Brotherhood says no woman or Christian should run for president, and they say, oh, well, they'll get used to the political system. I mean, they see them basically as good guys. And it's not that they're looking to be ruled by Sharia or that they want uh, a sheikh cleric as their president. But they may vote for these guys. Now, I think they would be open to alternatives. But for example, in Egypt, when I was there in February, I interviewed most of the leadership of the, the young 
activists who led the Tahrir Square, and there was an organization. There were several groups that came together, and they all had heads. And you know, I interviewed, and they were very impressive. And they ranged from, uh, you know, sort of left, real leftist uh, labor organizers, uh, liberals, uh, center right. I mean, it was a whole panoply, and Muslim Brotherhood youth, and. Um, the non-Muslim Brotherhood types, many of them recognized that if you were going to run a, a, a successful campaign, you had to coalesce. But they somehow, I don't know, expected older folks to do it or, I mean, they talked about doing computer campaigns. Some of them were even aware of Obama's campaign, of using, um, but it didn't gel. And all of these factions have either formed their own parties or stayed out of electoral politics. And what that means, depending on the electoral system, and that's still up for, I, I, I think, I, well, actually, I think Egypt is supposed to have a mixed system of lists and representatives in districts. But what you can have, if the system is so geared, is you can have liberal parties running against each other and knocking each other out. And so that's what happened with Hamas. That's why Hamas won, because Fatah never understood the dynamics, and they ran multiple candidates instead of having everybody vote for the same candidate in a district. And so the, <laughs> the, the, the Islamists came out with a bigger vote, although if Hamas had unified, they would have. So that's the way it's trending. Uh, in Tunisia and in Egypt, not for an Islamist majority, but for a strong plurality. Uh, I'm really interested to go there because in Tunisia, much more than in Egypt, uh, there is a wariness among the seculars of this and a lot of angst over it. And the question is, can they organize a coalition to countermand it, and I'm not sure. And the wild card in Egypt is, of course, the military and the former party of President Hosni Mubarak, which will come back in a different guise. And they will get a lot of seats because many of their former parliamentary representatives were like the big man in their village, and people will probably still vote for that big man. And what party the big man will belong to, I don't know, but there will be a a cohort of such people. So uh, no question the Islamists will be much more potent. Um, I think Tunisia is the most interesting case because it had the best prospects, but we'll see. Yes? Well, what, what do you think are the similarities and the differences in the various countries who've been involved in the Arab Spring? And how, would, how does all of that uh, bear relationship to the countries you've spoken about today? Well, you know, everybody nowadays is sort of lumping Afghanistan and Pakistan together with the Middle East, which really is incorrect. Um, you know, they're very different. And no belief from the mass of the people in institutions. Uh, in neutral institutions are an anomaly. I mean, basically, you had the ruler and the privileged group around the ruler. And then for poor people, you had family and mosque. And that's what they know. And neutral political parties that stand on platforms are just something new. I mean, and, and, and not something that people understand or trust. Uh, people understand individuals, tribal leader, religious leader, um, political family. And it's very hard to change that and have, you know, say, political parties that are based on values. And they are still struggling with the proper division between mosque and state. I mean, this is an issue that's up for grabs again because mosque was repressed as far as politics went. And so people are fond of mosque. First, it's their tradition. And second, it was their social service network. And they don't quite understand, you know, why that should be here, why that should be there. They don't believe in that. And yet, they, they do talk about rights for everyone. If you go to popular neighborhoods in Egypt, they talk, Muslims talk about, yes, there should be rights for Copts. And you know, it's, but nobody has experience in putting that together. And that is gonna be a long and painful 
learning curve. And plus which, the countries that don't have oil are all in deep economic trouble because they haven't developed vibrant private sectors. The reason why Turkey is doing so well, the reason why Erdogan can project himself as the new Ottoman leader is not because <coughs> he's a party with Islamic roots or because he's a great rhetor, uh, you know, rhetor, I can't say that word, rhetorician, <laughs> he, he, because he's a great speaker. After all, he speaks in Turkish and Arabs don't understand that. It, it's because the economy of Turkey is booming. And the reason the economy of Turkey is booming under AK Party is because before they came in, there were some banking reforms already completed. They went through their banking crisis a decade ago, and they stopped taking bad loans. But they have a real entrepreneurial business class who set up small companies not just family-owned, they expand beyond that. So unlike much of the Middle East, where it's a trading society, and where um, you know people uh, you know go into a family business, that's that's it. Uh, they don't they don't have this <coughs> private, small, medium-sized business mentality, and so Turkey is moving. The, in, uh, it's going to be much harder for those other Arab countries, which are state enterprise dominated, subsidized, and don't have oil. You know, Libya has oil, where Libya is gonna go, don't ask. You know, it's a non-country, and whether it can build institutions from the ground up, I can't tell you, but at least they have oil. Iraq, I mean, the saving grace is that people won't starve. Uh, you know, the country has oil, which of course can feed a dictator, <clears throat> but they've got it. You know, eventually, if they can figure out how to repair their infrastructure, they can rebuild. I mean, they could be a Saudi Arabia that paid off all their people. They've got a long way to go because under Saddam and under sanctions, the oil infrastructure is terribly degraded. And, and in fact, people are afraid of a collapse almost. And they're not even back to production pre-Saddam yet. But they could be double that. If they, so, you know, they've got the money, not the best way to live off oil, but they've got something. But a country like Tunisia or Egypt, they've got nothing. Egypt has a teeny bit of oil. So, anyway, um, I think I digressed. Well, I said. No, two questions. One, one came up when you were talking about Turkey. Uh, do you think uh, Hassan Rouhani is going to be On the social networks. Oh, okay. You don't mean the Moss social network. You mean the Facebook social yeah, network. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, on the on the secular history of Turkey, there is a. It's a very important question. It's a critically important element here, which is that because the army was in charge in Turkey, in. It, it, the critically important piece I'm talking about is in recent times, the Islamist political sector was domesticated, if you will. I mean, um, Erdogan, Erdogan's mentor, uh, a gentleman named Mr. Erbakan, who I believe died recently, was a far more radical Islamist who really wanted an Islamic state. and. His party was ruled illegal by the military. And in fact, Erdogan was thrown in jail once for four months for reciting a poem that talked about the mosque as, uh, it used imagery of the mosque in Turkish as the most important imagery, which was considered by the military to be a critique of Kemalism against the founder, because his image was supposed to be the one, and they threw him in jail for four months. Well, the upshot of this, undemocratic as it may have been, was that um, Erdogan uh, helped found his current party, AK Parti, 
understanding that they had to operate within certain limits. Now, many people think that now that they have a very heavy majority in Parliament, they're in a position to exceed their limits. And I think this is a very deep and dangerous question. There's dragnet arrests going on in Turkey that don't get much publicity of people who are critical of the government, and especially secularists. Um, however, the bottom line is that the extent of Islamicization, which was envisioned by the predecessor party, was squeezed out of Ark Parti, and I think there still are limits, which red lines, which they won't cross. In Egypt, for example, it's unclear whether the Egyptian military, which some see as playing that Kemalist role, will have either the strength or the guts to play the same role. They're uncomfortable with it. Um, you know, I spoke to one of the generals from the junta that's ruling now in the background, and you know, he bent over backwards to be nice to the Muslim Brotherhood and say we have no fears about them. I'm sure that isn't true, but that's the language that they're using, and I don't know whether the military has a, I doubt that they have a clear idea of how to rein the Islamists in if they get out of hand, especially the Muslim Brotherhood isn't the most radical group. I mean, they, um, they have a policy against violence, but the Salafists, who have been truly horrendous in the past, have now been able to form a political party, and they are much more radical. So I don't know it, whether the Turkey analogy will fly, and it's critical that it does, but we don't know if it will. As far as these networks, I think the short answer is no. I mean, the Facebook network seemed to have worked to rouse international sympathy, and it seemed to have connected all these bright young people in Cairo and Alexandria, but it doesn't seem to translate into the kind of political organizing, even in the urban areas among internet users, to get out the vote. Now, maybe they will turn people out, but if you don't have political lists that enable you to vote for the right candidates, uh, if they contradict each other and run against each other, all the Facebook in the world won't help. I think it's fair to say that we've had an incredibly important lesson today, and we see. Uh, that there are plenty of things wrong. I was telling uh, Trudy before she came up to speak that uh, the philosopher uh, Hannah Arendt had a description of the period between the two world wars. She called it between the no longer and the not yet. Well, I feel that's where we are. Maybe we're all, maybe people are always between the no longer and the not yet. But uh, we will, uh, we'll, we'll Watch and see. I think it's very important that we learned what we did today, and I thank Trudy for coming to, to give it to us. To give it to us. Thank you.